104 years ago today, August 27th, the Battle of Ambos Nogales took place. This battle was go, it was small and didn't last long. However, that battle had far-reaching consequences to this day. Ambos Nogales means both Nogales in Spanish. Nogales is a border town. Nogales, Arizona, United States of America, and Nogales, Sonora, Republic of Mexico. Running down the middle of Ambos Nogales is the International Street, the U.S. and Mexican border. This is where the first border wall was built. Before the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1920, citizens of both Nogales has freely crossed the border to trade, shop, and visit. Now, in her article for the Smithsonian Magazine, The Raging Controversy at the Border began with this incident 100 years ago. Rachel John wrote, Both Nogales is founded in 1882. Ambos Nogales became a bustling community center on the boundary line, which ran along International Street. For years, Mexicans and Americans crossed the border regularly to do business, shop, socialize, and celebrate the holidays of both nations. Years later, former residents recalled how they had even played on the line as children. This was all going to change drastically with the start of the Mexican Revolution in World War I. The battle for control of Mexican Nogales between General Alvaro Obregón and the Federal Garrison in 1913 and the Valistas and the Carancistas forces in 1950 led to cross-border firing into the U.S., which in turn led to America's involvement at the border. 1913 incident involved centrist General Obregón attacking federal forces stationed in Nogales, Mexico. The short Wikipedia article stated, March 23, 1913, rebel forces under General Obregón attacked the federal garrison of about 400 infantry. Obregón's army included infantry, infantry cavalry and at least one piece of artillery. Fighting lasted for a few hours before the federal commander, Kostor Litsky, was captured. The remaining federal troops retreated across the border and surrendered to the United States Army Garrison of Nogales, Arizona. There, Captain Smith relieved the federals of their weapons and they eventually found their way back to Mexico. Six rebels were killed in the action and nine were wounded. The federals lost four men killed and five wounded. And Nogales, Sonora fell to the Constitutionalists. There are no readily available contemporary reports of this attack, so there's not a lot of detail. The next major border crisis happened on November 21st, 1915. Over the previous two years, border incursions and firefights across the border were a common occurrence. Usually it was rebel forces crossing the border to escape capture by the federal forces or vice versa. On November 1st, 1915, Pancho Villa attacked the town of Agua Petra, which was controlled by the forces of Carranza. Via forces were defeated, his supplies were low, his men were ready to mutiny. Via needed to resupply and reorganize his troops. The closest place was the town of Nogales in Sonora. On the morning of November 26, rebel forces of Pancho Villa, who had occupied Nogales, Sonora, began firing on the United States Army soldiers in Nogales, Arizona. The Americans responded with counterfire for over two hours before a force of Carmenistas, aka the Constitutionalists, arrived to attack the Villistas later that day. Now the Constitutionalists accidentally opened fire on the American soldiers and another short skirmish was fought. The battle resulted in the deaths of several Mexicans and was the first significant engagement fought between Villistas and the United States military. Villa and his forces were allegedly evacuating the town and it was due to a few troops left behind who were drunk and looting the town that the firefight across the border into American troops started. Now General Frederick Funston, the commanding general of the Army's Southern Department after action report printed in the El Paso Herald on November 27, 1915 stated, in the action of November 26, no shots were fired by us except in return of Mexican fire. This applies to both the Eastas and the advance of the Constitutionalist troops under Colonel Cardenas, who opened fire on the troops of the 10th Cavalry under Captain Valentine and Company L, 12th Infantry. The latter company had three casualties, Private Little, mortally wounded in the head, died at 9 o'clock Friday night, Private Cates, flesh wound in the abdomen, and Private Sape, wounded in the ankle 
the two latter recovered. The border conflict would escalate after Pancho Villa attacked Columbus, New Mexico in 1916. In response to this attack, President Wilson authorized the punitive expedition to capture Villa. Now, from March 14, 1916 to February 7, 1917, General John J. Persing led a 10,000-man force into northern Mexico to capture Villa. The expedition was a disaster as far as capturing Villa. However, the lessons learned would be put to good use during World War II. The small border skirmishes were happening throughout 1916, 17, and 18. Most of these skirmishes took place when Mexican forces or Mexican rebels crossed the border looking for supplies. U.S. troops would respond with force to push the Mexicans back across the border. Two world-changing events were to alter the course of U.S.-Mexican relations. The first was all the way on the other side of the world. On Sunday, June 28, 1914, Guerrilla Princep, 19-year-old Bosnian Serb, decided it was time for the Archduke of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie, to die, so Bosnia could be free. Austria had annexed Bosnia in their empire in 1908. The opportunity came when the Archduke and his wife visited Sarajevo in Bosnia. The assassination attempt by Prince Sept and his four compatriots at first was farcical. The first assassin lost his nerve, let the motorcade pass by. The second assassin threw a bomb to miss the Archduke's car and exploded under the car following the Archduke and his wife. Dejected by their failure, the three other assassins gave up. Princess, Prince Sept went to a local del delicatessen to get something to eat. It was pure dumb luck. Princep was uh, able to kill the Archduke and his wife. The Archduke's motorcade had made a wrong turn. The driver, instead of continuing, decided to back up, which in turn caused the other cars of the motorcade to back up. This put the motorcade right in front of Princep, who was in the delicatessen. Princep came out, firing his pistol into their convertible car. This one event lit the fuse that started World War I. Now, the alliance system of Europe all but guaranteed war. Germany, Austria, and the Ottoman Empire against England and her dominions and colonies, France and her colonies, and Italy. The United States remained neutral, that is, until April of 1917. The second event was the Zimmerman telegram. President Woodrow Wilson refused to get involved in the war in Europe at first. Events just would not allow the United States to remain on the sideline. February 1, 1917, Germany announced the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare. That meant any ship, whether a belligerent or neutral, found in the war zone would be torpedoed. U.S. flag merchant ships were no longer safe from submarine attacks. Final straw came with the public release of the Zimmerman Note. German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman had the brilliant idea of making an alliance with Mexico. Mexico would attack the United States if the U.S. declared war on Germany. Now, in return, Mexico would get generous financial aid, and when Germany won the war, Mexico would get back their lost territories in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Mexico said, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Now, when the note became public, Wilson had no choice but to ask for a declaration of war against the Central Powers. Now, even though Mexico publicly declined Germany's offer, Reports of suspected German spies and troops gathering in the border towns flourished. This brings us to 1918. Now, since the beginning of the Mexican Revolution in 1910, border skirmishes were a constant issue. By 1917, it had become a way of life for people along the border. Now, after the U.S. declaration of war, security at the border was tightened. The normal way of life in Nogales, where residents could cross freely with little problems or inspection, was no longer the case. With the start of World War I, tensions at the border increased. As with all border towns, a U.S. Army detachment had been assigned to Nogales to help with border security. With the rumors of German spies and groups of white men seen on the Mexican side of the border, customs officials and the U.S. Army now were in a state of heightened alert. Border guards still handled the routine inspection of people coming and going across the border, but the army was there to quickly jump in in the event of a major engagement. Antagonism between custom officials and the Mexican population increased. Army intelligence learned of armed Mexicans in and around Nogales on the Mexican side of the border. Reports included presence of white men, 
supposed Germans addressing gatherings of Mexican citizens. An anonymous letter was also received from a man who identified himself as an ex ballista He was appalled by the atrocities of the Ballistas were committing and warned of a possible attack on Nogales around the 25th of August. As it happened, the 35th Infantry at Nogales was in the process of embarking for France and leaving only two troops of the 10th Cavalry and Guard units of the 35th Infantry as the only Army presence in the area. Commander there, Colonel Frederick Herman, requested reinforcements, including the machine gun troops. Up to this point, everything seemed clear, but hang on. When looking at a historical event, you must look at all sides to get a better understanding of why this incident took place. Now, Carlos Parra, a visiting assistant professor of Chicano and Latino studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, wrote an article for his webpage, uh, nomadic Borders, the Battle of Ambos Nogales. Now in his article, Mr. Parra brings up some very interesting facts about life on the border. Now Mr. Parra states in his key points, anti-Mexican racism, violence, increased border controls by U.S. Customs and military officials in Nogales led to the everyday harassment of Mexican border crosses. A race riot August 15th, 1915, as well as repeated border shootings, including the killing of at least two Mexican men from 1917 to 1918, ratcheted up the tension. The Arizona Republican reported in their August 16, 1915 edition, last night's riot between Mexicans armed with knives and guns announced they were going to clean up the gringos, and then they pushed two soldiers off the street into the gutter. Soldiers bunched all over the town and attacked the Mexicans. A special detail was sent by the commander of the American troops to gather them back to camp. Now, the newspaper does not use the word race riot anywhere in its reporting. That does not mean it was not a race riot. What we have to do is understand, especially with contemporary news reports, who are these people writing for? Who's their audience? What is their purpose? Now, the report states only the trouble started when half-drunk Mexicans armed with knives and guns announced they were going to clean up the gringos. It's pretty inflammatory. If I, I bet you if I could read Spanish, I'm sure I would find a newspaper article, more than one, written by a reporter on the Mexican side stating something similar, only it would say a half dozen drunken American soldiers armed with knives and guns announced they were going to clean up the Mexicans. I mean, if you look beyond the bias of this newspaper report, it is clear that race played a major part in this riot on both sides of the border. Now, by August of 1918, America had been in the war for just over a year. Patriotic Americans were urged to report any suspicious activity or disloyal talk to the government. The worry that Germany was sending spies up through Mexico into the U.S. was a very real concern for the U.S. government. It was just natural that tensions at the border escalated. In months leading up to August 1918, U.S. Customs officials at Nogales killed two Mexican citizens while entering the U.S. through the ambiguously defined border. On the afternoon of the 31st of December 1917, Francisco Mercado, an off-duty Mexican custom agent, attempted to cross into Nogales, Arizona. Despite calls from a U.S. Army sentry who asked him in English to stop before various eyewitnesses, the soldiers shot and killed Mercado. The killing of Gerardo Pesquera the deaf-mute son of the former Sonora governor happened when U.S. sentries ordered the unarmed man to halt as he approached the border. Unable to hear the order, Pesquera continued walking, whereupon the guards opened fire. These incidents inflamed an already volatile issue. With the change in the security at the border, U.S. Customs officials and border sentinels could sometimes become hostile towards the Mexican residents crossing the border. The new inspection requirements were confusing to civilians as well as the U.S. troops that helped guard the border. Nogales was a powder keg, just waiting for a match to be lit. That match was struck on August 27, 1918. The newspaper, The Border Vendette, Nogales, Arizona, August 31, 1918, stated, Fighting began about 4 o'clock Tuesday afternoon, when a Mexican suspected of being a smuggler attempted to cross into Mexico near the U.S. Customs House. A.A. A. Barber, a United States Customs Inspector and an American Border Sentinel, commanded the man to halt at the same time pointing their guns at him. They did not shoot, 
but a Mexican guard appeared and deliberately opened fire on the sentinel, shooting him through the lung. He died later at the base, at the base hospital. Later reports and historical research give a slightly different account of how this battle began. At approximately 4.10 in the afternoon, a Mexican carpenter named Zeferino Gil La Madrid attempted to pass through the border back to Mexico without having a parcel he was carrying with him inspected at the customs house. As Gill passed the customs office, customs inspector A.G. Barber ordered him to halt. Suspecting that Gill was smuggling weapons or pamphlets, only a few feet away from the Mexican, Mexican customs officer led by Francisco Gallegos directed him to ignore the summons and stay put in Mexico. Gill became confused and hesitated as the two groups of custom agents shouted instructions at him. At this point, Private William Clint of the U.S. 35th Infantry raised his Springfield rifle in an effort to force Gill to return to the U.S. In the midst of the ensuing commotion, a shot was fired. Although it is suspected it was only a warning shot to the air fired by Clint to prevent Gill from taking his cargo further into Mexico. There was no mention of Private Clip firing the first shot, warning or otherwise, in the article written right after the event. Subsequent accounts mention Clint and the warning shot. All the accounts reported that Clint died as a result of the Mexican border guard's shot. The interesting thing is, Clint did not die. The website www.cacti35th.com, History of the 35th Infantry Regiment, Beginnings, as they call it, PDF, has a picture of William Clint with his wife. Clint told his story of the events that day to his family. Private Clint's story of that fateful day is completely different from what contemporary news accounts told. So, what happened to Clint that day? His grandniece, Mary Louise Becker, was able to get the facts from Clint. Quote, He was guarding the border between the United States and Mexico. I don't remember him telling us where it was. He said that he was at a train depot, telegraph office. They saw a train coming up towards the border with what appeared to be the whole Mexican army. The Mexican military was trying to run the border in order to get two German agents who were carrying counterfeit U.S. currency across the border. Bill said that the Mexican shot his buddy dead and that when he saw his friend lying dead, he just went berserk, turned on the approaching Mexican army and started shooting them. Bill was struck by bullets again and again. He was shot in the arm, the palm, so he had a crippled left hand for life. The Mexican army kept shooting him, and he just kept on fighting. He was shot in the chest, and the bullet was lodged so close to his heart that the surgeons just left it there. Finally, he took a bullet to the head. I don't know if that's what finally put him temporarily out of the fight. Bill said he killed two German spies, and he had no idea how many Mexican soldiers. He said that... They were lying dead all over the tracks. We never once doubted that Bill Clinton was telling the truth. William Hugh Clint was declared dead by the army. They sent word back to his parents in Chicago that Bill had been killed in action. Then the army sent word that no, Bill wasn't dead. Then they said word that he was dead, and then again not dead. His family didn't know what to think. Finally, his mother Mary Clint said, I'll know that our Billy is alive when I see him walking down this street. The family was astonished when, one day, Billy did, in fact, come walking down the street. Now, the only other source I found that said Clint did not die was by Carlos Pata. However, all he said was that Clint had not had lived. Now, Clint told his version of the incident decades after the event. Now, with the passing of years, people tend to forget the details of a specific event. However, what happened to Clint was so horrific that I personally believe his retelling the story of what happened on that day is accurate. You tend to remember important events in your life. You know, Pearl Harbor, the day Kennedy was shot, 9-11, and the day that you are shot five times while a Mexican train was running the border and your best friend was killed right next to you, that's pretty traumatic. And you're probably going to remember the details, just as it happened. Anyways, with the evidence uncovered in 2018 by Cacti.com, history of the allegations of German spies on the border is now a valid theory again. Counterfeiting is a form of economic warfare, but why would the government cover that up? 
You have to put yourself in the shoes of the actors at this time to understand the events. Racism had a part to play in this event to be sure, but how much? Don't know. The, these were young soldiers in the 35th Infantry, hastily trained, believing in what their country and government said. Their job was to stop smuggling arms, munitions, and propaganda from going over the border to help the Mexican rebels. They were also there to stop potential German agents from entering the United States. I don't think we'll ever know who fired that first shot that started the ballot, Battle of Nogales. Was it the alleged warning shot of Private Clinton? Was he even at the border crossing that day? Was it the shot from a U.S. Customs official, Barbara? Was it the return fire from the Mexican border guard? What about the multiple conflicting telegram to Clint's mother? He's dead, then he's alive, then he's dead again, then he's alive. The U.S. Army investigation into this incident places the majority of the blame on the Mexican border officials, of course, and a number of irresponsible civilians who had begun organizing against the U.S. since the December 31st, 1917 killing of Inspector Francisco Mercado. Some Mexican customs inspectors and supportive civilians declared that if there were any more trouble on the line, all should get arms and proceed immediately to the line for the purpose of avenging themselves on the Americans. What else could the army say? The U.S. was in the beginning of the Hundred Days Offensive in Europe against Germany. They needed the people's support. The last thing the government wanted was the American public questioning the integrity and honor of the U.S. Army and by extension the U.S. government. No one will know for sure what happened that day. Somewhere in the National Archives is a document or documents or letters, most likely in boxes that have never been opened, which could shed light on the events of August 27, 1918. So, what is the takeaway from this event? Well, if you should happen to be an Archduke in a motorcade and your driver takes a wrong turn, don't let him back up. Also, if you're planning to attack your enemy by enlisting your enemy's neighbor, I wouldn't send the telegram. Have the note hand delivered. And most importantly, if you see a train trying to run the border, a 1903 Springfield rifle just ain't going to cut it. Anyways, this is our history. This is our heritage. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell to be notified every time I post new videos. Thank you for watching.